overwhelming that we're in the shaking time, we need to press together. Press together. This is from second, te- second volume of the testimony. She says, I have tried in the fear of God to set before His people their danger and their sins and have endeavored to the best of my feeble efforts to arouse them. I have stated startling things which if they had believed would have caused them distress and terror and led them to zeal in repenting of their sins and iniquities. You know, one of the unfortunate things about the gift of prophecy when somebody has it is they have to call sin by its rightful name, don't they? Can you imagine being blessed with the gift of prophecy but your work is, is telling people to straighten up and walk straight? You know, <laughs> you've got sin in your life. Writing letters and the things that she was called to do. Do you know how weighty that would be on somebody? I have stated before that from what was shown me, but a small number of those professing to believe the truth would eventually be saved. Now listen to this. A small number is going to eventually be saved. And listen to this next sentence. Not because they could not be saved. You understand that God is not trying to keep us out of the kingdom. You do understand that, I hope. That He has paid the ultimate price. He has made every effort. He is doing everything within His power to get you in. So trust me, friends. If you ever are tempted to think about God as, you know, He's just looking for a way to keep me out. He's just looking for a reason to keep me out of that kingdom. Trust me, that is not the case. He is weeping over what we will not surrender to Him. She says, it's not because they could not be saved, but because they would not be saved in God's own appointed way. I mean, He's done everything. He's paved the way. His arms are open wide. But it's because as, as a people, we would not be saved in His appointed way. The way marked out by our divine Lord is too narrow and the gate too straight to admit them while grasping the world or while cherishing selfishness or sin of any kind. You ever hear the story of the monkey who reaches in the glass to pull out a piece of food? He can't get his hand out of the glass because once he makes a fist, it's too big to fit out through the opening. And that stupid monkey will not let go of the food to get his hand out of the glass. I've actually heard that this is how they catch monkeys in some parts of the world. Right? And they come up upon this monkey and the monkey's screaming and, you know, yanking on this thing and can't get away. And all he has to do is let go. And his hand would pop right out of there. That's us. We're a bunch of monkeys. We won't let go of it. We will cherish something that the angels look at and just, they can't believe it. See, you know, they know the glories of heaven. Another thing, you're willing to hold on to that piece of garbage? It's not worth it. She says, there is no room for these things, and yet there are but few who will, be, who will consent to part with them, that they may pass the narrow way and enter the straight gate. The words of Christ are plain. Strive, agonize to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. And then she says, not all Christians are Christians at heart. And these trials, you know, this great trial that we're about to go through will reveal that, won't it? And so those who we've looked at, we thought, man, they're certainly going in. It might be revealed that they've been acting the whole time. It's not real. It's not genuine. I don't want to fall into that camp. I know you don't either. I mean, I want to be genuine with God. I want to be real with Him. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, we read this in Sabbath school. I'm always thrilled and pained at the same time when Sabbath school steals your thunder, you know? 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. And then I turn, turn to Hebrews. Why did I do that? 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. Paul is talking about this race. And he says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Did Paul recognize that he was in danger if he wasn't careful of losing out? I mean, here he is helping other people enter into the kingdom of God, but he ends by saying, I have to be careful. Because if I don't bring myself into that discipline. If I don't watch myself, I could become disqualified. I could get to the end of the race and what would be more painful than running a race, a marathon or something, and being so close to the finish line that you could see it and not making it. That would be horrific. And we've all entered the race, haven't we? 
We're all marching to Zion, if you will. I don't want to see any of us fall down shy of that finish line. It just won't be worth it. Testimonies, Volume 5. Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. Instead of being strengthened and confirmed by opposition, threats, and abuse, they will cowardly take the side of opposers. I have a bunch of quotes here. I'll just skip over them. Sec- uh, just one more. Second selected messages, she says, and this is, this is famous. We, we could probably complete this. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains. You ever heard that quote before? Did you ever hear the rest of it? I'll read it again. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. We like to trumpet that. Encourage everybody, right? Stay in the building, stay in the church, and you'll be fine. But listen, it remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The church is going through. That's undebatable. The real question is, will you? Will I go through? Because there is a sifting, a shaking, and it's the sinners who will be sifted out. The chaff, she says, will be separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. We must be divested of our self-righteousness and arrayed in the righteousness of Christ. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Lest you think that God isn't pleading with us. Ezekiel 18. There are some scriptures that I can just feel the emotion of God pouring out of. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verses 30 through 32. God says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent. Do you hear him pleading with you? Mm-hmm. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. He's pleading. Verse 31, Cast away from you all the transgressions which have been committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. Can you feel the emotion in that Scripture? God is pleading with you, don't let my sacrifice be in vain. I bled for you. And He would have done it if you were the only one. He still would have done it. And He's pleading. Don't let it be in vain. Turn in the New Testament to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Verse 41. Now as He, Christ, drew near, He saw the city and wept over it. Now let me just stop right there. I mean, this is, this is God. Right? Weeping. Think about that. What is it that makes God cry? He drew near, He saw the city, and He wept over it. What what was He seeing? What was He feeling that would bring Him to such an emotional response? He says, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children with you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus was overwhelmed with an emotion that caused Him to weep over the fact that He was trying to get through to the people to turn to the only thing that could give them peace. And they would not. Another place, he's looking out over Jerusalem. He says, oh, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. But if there's ever an argument against predestination, it's right there, isn't it? Because here's God saying, this is what I wanted, and you wouldn't do it. Predestination says that you'll do whatever God says. Some of you are created to be lost. Some are created to be saved. That's not true. It's not true. God is not willing that any should perish. That tells me that predestination is a debunked doctrine. Doctrine of devils, really, when you think about it. Because it